Good morning and welcome to the University at Albany Center for Public Health Preparedness Grand Round Series. I'm Chris Smith and I'll be your moderator today. Before we start, we would like to ask you to please fill out your evaluations online. Continuing education credits are available after completing the post-test and your feedback is always helpful to the development of future programs. We encourage you to participate today and we will take your calls later in the hour. The toll-free number is 800-452-0662. You may also send your written questions at any time by fax to 518-426-0696 or by email to the address on your screen. Here to speak with us today on the subject of adapting standards of care under extreme conditions are Dr. Christine Gebby, Elizabeth Standish Gill Professor of Nursing and Director of the Center for Health Policy at Columbia University School of Nursing and Dr. Kathleen M. White, Associate Professor and Director of Faculty Practice at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. Thank you both for joining us today, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gebby, let's start with you. What's the focus of our discussion today? It is this issue of how you adapt care when the conditions become extreme, whether weather related or any other kind of emergency, and you can't do what you're used to doing. Dr. White, don't health care pro professionals learn how to function under extreme conditions in their professional training? Unfortunately, they don't. I mean, we have lots of content to cover in our educational programs, and that's just not one of the things that, um, that we stress in the programs. And it usually isn't until they get out into their um, first working environment that they uh, are even uh, experience the, the kinds of things that go along with um, disaster planning. So that's yeah, a cause for concern? Well, it is, because you can be uh, doing what you usually do, but the world around you has changed drastically. You don't have the resources you're used to having. You can be in a setting you're not used to being in, like instead of in a hospital, in a gymnasium somewhere. Or you can have patients you're not used to seeing. You usually work with children, and suddenly you're being asked to care for adults or uh, care for the elderly. You put all that together, and it becomes very hard for someone to think through what they ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. well, how can such fears be assuaged? Well, you need to learn the uh, practices and the planning that will get you where you need to go. Uh, you're worried about your license. You're worried about meeting expectations. If you haven't planned ahead, you can't minimize the damage. You can't be sure you and your patients are going to be safe. And you can't be sure that the resources you do have are going to be wisely invested. They can end up being wasted. So let's follow up on that, Dr. Gebby. So how can emergency planning affect the efficiency of a disaster response? It can make sure that you get people that you need where you need them, that those who need care get to where people with professional skills are located, and that the resources are there for those who need them. In terms of responding to a disaster, how do we ensure the safety of responders from either physical or psychosocial, psychological harm? Well, a lot of it is in this advanced preparation. It's in knowing ahead of time where you're going to go, what might be coming up, uh, what you might need to have available. Mm -hmm. And I want to take a moment here to just uh, plug an online course that the Center for Public Health Preparedness is developing. It's called Personal Care for Emergency Responders, and I understand that's due to be launched in 2009. Dr. White, some viewers may watch this program and immediately think of preparedness at the organizational or institutional level, but you stress both preparedness at the organizational level and also for the individual, don't you? Oh, absolutely, and in fact, it's, it's extremely important that um, the individual take responsibility for becoming prepared and set their own preparedness plan in motion. Uh, they really um, have to be ready uh, to respond to emergencies, and uh, during the, the group that we convened um, to prepare the white paper that you referred to um, that was the impetus for this um, broadcast, um, we heard over and over again about individual um, preparedness or, or readiness for emergency situations. So how does an individual go about beginning to put together a preparedness plan? Well, uh, there's, there's several things that um, individuals can do. You have to think um, in, a, in a personal and professional readiness plan um, about essential things that you would need if there um, was to be an emergency. Um, 
um, things like uh, what supplies might you need to have um, in your home um, uh, that you would have readily available? What medications are you on? And would you have a, a three, four, five day supply? What kind of documents or papers might you need um, to have um, readily available if you found yourself in an emergency situation? Um, in addition to those kinds of you know, very specific things, you also have to think about a communication plan for your family. How would, you, if an emergency happened and you were all not together, how would you communicate with the family? How would they communicate with you? And you would want to make sure that you have um, the backup that you would need in an emergency situation so that uh, you would be able to um, work if you needed to um, if that happened to arise. So it's the, the whole idea of planning first um, for your individual preparedness. And I think that point you made about having the backup for your family's needs is so critical because you may have every intention of responding and doing all you can, but if you have a family emergency, obviously there are some priorities that can't be ignored. Oh, absolutely, and I think that's the key to making sure that this plan includes um, your family in it and they are well aware of what would have to happen um, in an emergency situation. Yeah. That, that you know where your kids will be if they're mm -hmm. evacuated from their school, that you have a plan for who's going to deliver dinner to grandma, if that's mm -hmm. something you usually do, all of those pieces. And again, to put in a, a little bit of a plug, there are a number of courses on personal preparedness that are available in a variety of places, including one that's available from the School of Public Health here that an individual provider might want to take to get ready for uh, these kind of emergencies. Maybe we could take this discussion one step forward, uh, going to planning on a larger scale. Uh, the National Incident Management System strives to unify various agencies, groups, and individuals in an emergency, just so many players that have to come together and have to have a coordinated response. But how is that collaboration achieved? It's achieved with a lot of meetings, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but indeed, the National Incident Management System provides us a uniform national framework a vocabulary, uh, key terms, the ways that people can work together, how the system fits into one, because it covers thinking about planning ahead of time, responding during an event with a good command system so people get where they're going, with the recovery, with doing everything you can to minimize emergencies. Unless groups have thought about that ahead of time, and met at a local level, at a state level, at a national level, it won't work. And we have some real experiences where it doesn't quite always work perfectly every time and can fall apart. And this isn't something that comes naturally to public health, is it? The whole incident command system, incident management system mindset. It's something we've had to learn. A lot of people in public health are less used to chains of command. Uh, here we're thinking not just of public health, but of the whole medical, nursing, dental community. And while people who work on staff of hospitals may be used to having somebody telling them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis, somebody in an office practice, somebody in a clinic, rather like public health, is used to being a little mm -hmm. island of independence. Mm -hmm. And we're saying during emergencies, not quite so smart to behave right. that way. The hospital incident command system has been in place for a while, but really need to extrapolate that to all the players. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What are some of the requirements currently in place for emergency and medical professionals in terms of uh, emergency response? Well, uh, the Joint Commission um, that accredits our hospitals and healthcare organizations have some very specific standards that have been developed um, for um, this kind of, of um, emergency situation. They're standards that relate um, to our hospitals, all different kinds of hospitals, including critical access hospitals, which we have in uh, rural areas, um, and our long-term care facilities. And uh, that deals with um, areas like um, communication, resources, safety, um, the responsibility of staff, um, what we would do if um, utilities um, have to be managed in a different way, and uh, broadly about all of the clinical activities. Um, in addition to the Joint Commission, there's also um, state regulations um, that our hospitals um, uh, have in place that also deal um, with disaster preparedness and disaster planning that um, most hospitals um, even practice because of the state regulations um, and have drills and exercises so that they can make sure that what they've planned for um, is something that they can actually perform. And, and that, that's a critical point because planning is obviously crucial. But have we been able to measure how, what the result is during real incidents? What has this planning led to in terms of uh, better performance? 
you can see a, a variety of improved performance across the country. And if you talk to places that have experienced bad weather or a sudden outbreak of communicable disease uh, or a hospital power outage, you can hear anecdotally a, a increasing number of reports of improved response, less downtime, less anxiety about patient care, all of those things that make for a better response. And what's important for people to remember in this process is that you haven't changed just because there's an emergency. It's the circumstances that have changed. You still have every skill you had before it started. You still have the um, same range of responsibilities and standards that affect what you're doing. You have to think of how to use those in a different place or with a different set of supports around you. Obviously, legal issues are something that are very much a part of this planning process. Dr. White, can you share some relevant legal aspects that our viewers could keep in mind? Oh, sure. Um, there are um, very important legal aspects for um, the, as the, the foundation for this work. Um, our professional organizations, um, for us as nurses, the American Nurses Association has um, developed some foundational documents um, that have um, uh, that can be used um, by us as professionals that include um, statements um, and, and reference to emergency preparedness and um, response competencies. Things like our scope and standards for um, professional practice um, for nurses. Um, we also have a professional code of ethics that was um, developed by the ANA. Now the standards themselves you know, are statements um, that um, show what our direct responsibilities are as professionals. And so so we use them then in an emergency situation because as um, Dr. Gebby said, um, we really haven't changed. It's a situation around us that has and so those standards still apply and we have to um, make sure that all nurses realize that. The same with the code of ethics. You know, when we talk about respect for the individual and integrity and um, ethical decision making, all of those things are still really important even in an emergency situation. What part does the national guidelines yeah. care play? Well, in addition, um, there are lots of national guidelines also that now have been um developed that help us in specific situations. So you can see national guidelines for pandemic. You can see national guidelines um, for other emergency type situations um, that we face. And so all of those really form together, form that legal basis that, um, that not one of them really would stand alone, that we need to you know, make sure we're clear on. And that is part of that nurse's individual preparedness that um, in fact he or she knows those documents and knows what their response Possibilities are. And I want to underscore that it's probably easiest for both of us to keep using the word nurse when we talk about professional yes. responsibilities because mm -hmm. that happens to be the core education we both have. But every health profession has similar documents, mm -hmm. similar guidelines, simi similar ethical standards, often using almost the same language that provide the same kind of guidance and support for the professional in a circumstance of an emergency. Just, just a thought, um, nursing professionals, other healthcare professionals in a hospital setting, they're so busy today. Do you think that the majority have had time to really acquaint themselves with these and, and, to, and to be familiar with what would be expected? I don't really know how to answer that because a piece of me wants to say, of course, every professional reads all of these documents at least once a week to be sure they're on top <laughs> of them. You, know, you can see my, my tongue in my cheek. I think busy professionals learn them when they were in school, they were introduced to them, they may go to a continuing ed program mm -hmm. once in a while or they go to their professional association and are reminded. But they're focusing on care of their patients who are right in front of them right now. Mm -hmm. And hopefully a broadcast such as this and the documents we're going to refer to as resources will help them uh, quickly remind themselves of where they need to go. And I think to add on to that, um, I think in each situation in, in our healthcare organizations, as we implement a new program, and so if uh, you happen to be implementing the emergency preparedness plan or, or having a disaster drill, um, the staff education and involvement in that directs them back to these kind of documents. And we do that with mm -hmm. implementation of other programs in healthcare organizations that you know, bring them back to what's your responsibility in this new program within your scope of practice, within your standards of care um, uh, as it relates also to your code of ethics. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gibby, let me pose this question to you. Even if the chain of command is in place during an emergency, things are going strictly according to the protocol, as we would hope there'd be, there's certainly going to be many, many challenges. How can 
expectations for care be met when certain essentials just are not going to be available? If they're not there, you can't invent them. And part of this whole process is to understand that nobody can hold you, for example, to using an electric pump when there is no electricity. You have to use the best supply you can out of the available supplies. If you've had a plan ahead of time, you've thought about, for example, I know one hospital that's trying to remind their nurses that there was a day when we did IV medications without fancy electric pumps. You stood there and counted little drops and calculated medicine. And they're reminding them that you can still meet the care even without the equipment or the power. You can still meet the care if you don't have quite the same number of workers because some of your professional staff and your support staff who are very important in a hospital just couldn't get to work or just didn't get to work. And that remains one of our concerns is shortage of staff. And, and Dr. White, let me follow up on that because we may forget that those who are employed to take care of our loved ones also have family members and, and loved ones of their own and a basic instinct for survival when they have to go into an emergency situation. So how can healthcare planners or can they ensure that their workforce will be there and prepared to serve in an extreme emergency? Well, I think we can only ensure it as far as the plans go. And so, um, you know, again, stressing that each individual has that responsibility to put in place and know what their plan would be and to then be able to feel comfortable that if I have to go, my children, um, my relatives, my family will be cared for and will be safe and I'll be able to, um, to go into the work setting. But, you know, additionally, organizations have, have to, um, as you say, um, expect that their workers will be there and you know as healthcare um, as healthcare workers we do have that responsibility to in fact respond when and if an emergency situation occurs. And some of us may be slower than others to respond because of the responsibilities that we have. But um, in fact, um, all the experiences that I've had, um, workers have um, responded and actually in great numbers. Mm -hmm. You're both familiar with the Journal of the American Medical Association article that ask, actually suggests there should be penalties for healthcare professionals who, who refuse to serve during an emergency. What do, what is the obligation of healthcare professionals um, and others who are employed, you know, to take care of patients in an emergency? What is their obligation to show up? You have obligations to your employer. You've said you will work. Uh, most employers understand a sudden emergency, uh, assuming you've done what you can to inform them. I think the biggest problem, and the one where both an employer penalty and possibly a, a, a legal licensure penalty, would be if you were there when the emergency started, you started caring for patients, and then you abruptly left. That, to me, would be the most difficult situation. And, in fact, we've had some legal challenges around that process, patient starting the patient abandonment. So we know how severely our society takes that as a, a reneging on the license we've been given. Uh, but, again, if people have plans and have organized and are talking with their employers about these challenges, our expectation is that there's a way to overcome that and work around it. Dr. Mm -hmm. White, you were nodding. Did you want to add anything to no, that? I, no, I agree totally. And I think that, that last, um, the last part that you mentioned is, I think, the most important, that the expectation is there that we would plan and that would, we would respond, but each within our own constraints. And I, and I mm -hmm. think that that's what's important. Yeah. Are there other challenges, Dr. Gebby, to meeting expectations? Yeah, we've talked about a couple, but I want to add the issue of the sudden influx of patients. You may be used to seeing 20 new patients a day and suddenly there are 100 people at your door. You may be used to having 10 rooms with one patient in each room and suddenly you've got two patients in each room and a long line out in the hallway. So figuring out how to take care of them and how to take care of their associated family members who may be extremely fearful and uh, worried about it. And add to that the potential that you're somewhere where you are not used to being. Uh, a hospital evacuated and trying to care for its patients in a high school cafeteria, mm -hmm. a long-term care facility, as has happened here in New York, caring for its patients in the educational building of a prison mm -hmm. complex. 
uh, where they can get power from an emergency generator, but they're not in their own surroundings. And so making do with what you have, where you have it, doing the best you can for your patients. What about this issue of the worried sick? And we've said this on this program before. Uh, used to be referred to as the worried well, but they truly do have symptoms mm -hmm. um, based on the uh, extreme emergency. And they tend to think of healthcare facilities as safe havens. Perhaps they show up, mm -hmm. uh, and that really puts a further strain on the, on the services. Sure. How do we plan for that? Again, communities have plans for that. Hospitals have plans for that. Uh, generally, a triage system at the door so that the people who primarily need verbal help or emotional help are steered away from places like emergency rooms where you're trying to put bodies back together and are put in a safe and warm place where there is some emotional help, somebody who can double check that their symptoms are not dreadful, uh, but again, keep them out of the way of what may appear to be more acute needs. If they have done personal plans at home and have a battery operated radio and have a plan for communication, they may be able to sort themselves out a little bit and minimize the number who show up. I want to back up to something you talked about just before this last question. Um, that has to do with the evacuation mm -hmm. challenges. It's a huge challenge, as we've all seen, simply to get people who are not ill evacuated to safety in, mm -hmm. for instance, a weather emergency. Now, translate that to people who are bedridden, um, not ambulatory, or perhaps weak because of illness can walk. How do you evacuate, how do you deal with that challenge of evacuating hospital or nursing home patients? Well, you should sit and talk at a planning meeting at a <laughs> hospital or a nursing home because it is a very scary uh, situation for them to confront. They start by looking at, can we just move people to half of our institution? Can we move them to this side or that side or upstairs or downstairs to have them in a safer place? Uh, because they may not have access to ambulances to do all the transport. They may have to put people in a bus. Uh, they may have to put people in a truck. Uh, they will have to ask some people to walk who would otherwise be pushed in a chair because the chairs are being used for people who might otherwise have been flat in a bed. I mean, it's going to be a, a, a leveling using as many staff and volunteers as you have available to try and keep people safe and comfortable. And, and and I was going to just add that, and it's practicing that kind of thing, yes. because that's not something I have to say that as nurses that, that um, we are educated to do, to, to move um, uh, you know, mattresses with patients in them if we have to you know, do that. If you know, we can't use the elevators, if the electricity yeah. is out, we're not going to be able to push the bed into the elevator, go down to the second floor and consolidate patients there. And so we might be um, bringing patients in their mattresses down steps. And so the idea of planning for that and practicing and and there are, there are some um, new equipment, you know, kinds of things that are available to assist in those, but whether or not, uh, you know, a hospital has, um, you know, made that a capital purchase um, in it um, is, you know, that's just something that, you know, comes right. with them additional planning. It's not necessary, but um, there are some uh, additional aids that can be used. Yeah. I but actually saw some pictures of that, and I'm not going to give the brand name, but it's almost like a sled type device. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And then. I think we may actually see that a little later. The... Um, uh, practice is an interesting one because most of us have stopped short of practicing taking Mrs. Smith out of her bed, putting her on the floor and, and hauling her down the stairwell. Thank you. But in fact, <laughs> I, I know hospitals that have uh, stocked up with big sandbags that add up to the average weight of a patient. So you, you get to the point of, well, now is when I would take Ms. Smith and put her on the mattress and haul her down the stairs. You leave her comfortably in her bed. Thank you. And put the sandbags <laughs> on the mattress and practice doing that. And it becomes a realistic practice for staff of, oh, it isn't just bump, bump, bump. It no. really takes some muscle. It takes mm -hmm. some thinking to not injure yourself while you're doing it. So the kind of practice has been bumped up a notch mm -hmm. or two. Mm -hmm. And, of course, then when you get the patients where they're now safe, but it may be something like an auditorium setting where everybody is... Um, row on row, yep. close to the floor, or maybe on yeah. a cot, and you have people that have to try to, um, well, I think uh, we can see the slide here. Yeah. Um, this does not look like your typical hospital, but you might be giving, in some circumstances, a hospital level of care here where nobody has real privacy, where you're taking care of bodily functions that may be visible to people in another bed, where you are asking family members to do observations that you might otherwise be able to do yourself and keep you posted, but the, the expectation that you'll use what you have, the best ability you can to meet the patient's needs, remains the same. Yeah, and, and I have to 
imagine that we were looking at a visual of real circumstances mm -hmm. and not a drill there. And I believe so. Daunting, I think that was a real daunting evacuation. challenge, isn't that? Yeah. Well, I want to go back, Dr. White, to a person's obligation to work during an emergency. Um, are there ethics that govern us in that situation? Oh, absolutely, and I think this is at when you get into an emergency situation, this is where we begin to um, implement what's called a utilitarian framework for decision making. Uh, and it's important that um, everyone understand the, that utilitary framework because you're really looking at the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And so it means that um, not everyone uh, will receive the services that they might that might have been available at other times. And so you see a, a sharp focus um, on that for each individual and that care decisions are made, you know, not not really about the most or the best, which is what, um, you know, in healthcare in the United States, we um, <laughs> expect and um, want um, every day for ourselves and for our relatives. And so it's really changing that focus from the individual to that greater good for um, the organization, the community, um, in trying to um, respond to the emergency. Mm -hmm. And this has to be communicated very transparently, doesn't it, Dr. White? Yes, absolutely. Again, because um, it gets to where you, um, you have fear unfortunately among the public if in fact we aren't transparent in our communications if they don't understand exactly um, where we are in the emergency what services are available what services are not available and when they might return and who's doing what in that uh, um, emergency and who's making the decisions um, it's that fear of the unknown that the public um, I, I think is it's the worst for the public um, and in fact um, when uh, you might see see uh, patients that normally would not be discharged, for instance, from a facility, that during an emergency situation, family members may be called in to say, please come and take your relative home. We don't have the resources to take care of, of your relative, and we need to focus on the emergency situation. Mm -hmm. And it gets at, I think, what Dr. Gebby mentioned um, from the, the JAMA article about that um, abandonment, that we're not abandoning patients, but at this point in time, um, the, the decision making has to be for those most um, critically ill and um, and focusing on the disaster and so that you know other types of care that we would normally give just um, are not going to be given. And actually that opens the door to thinking a little bit about the cascade mm -hmm. that if you send a person who's usually in the hospital home earlier than usual you may then call the home health agency and say you're going to now have a new patient who has this higher level of need the home health agency may then have to say to a family I know we usually come three times a week but we're only going to be able to come once a week and here's what we need you to do in between so that it it moves all the way through the care system yeah, that when you see that, because then you you have you know additional patients um, in all different areas yeah. of the care system, and then you experience unfortunately a shortage um, for workers throughout. So when you say the cascade, I mean, it goes it really goes throughout, yeah. and and the public needs to understand that. Yeah. So the transparent communication again, mm -hmm. right. collaborative planning is crucial. Absolutely, and then communicating while it's happening as well. Uh, we're used to thinking. I believe in this country more about the one-time disaster. Mm -hmm. Something big falls down, goes boom, emergency rooms are flooded for an hour or two or three or even for half a day, and then it all sorts itself out. You're a little bit crowded in one hospital, but there's always the hospital in the next town. It all sorts out. We're here talking about mega events, larger events that either go on longer, like a whole town without power for many days, or um, a large epidemic that cuts across the country where everybody is swamped and we're trying to sort the bits out. Not going to be business as usual and we can't keep to that mindset. Exactly, exactly. So Dr. Gebby, what would you see as priorities to, well, to set during an emergency? In, in considering this with actually a mixed panel of physicians, nurses, attorneys, we had hospital directors, we had all kinds of people in the room, came down to three fundamental things that have to be at the top of everybody's list. First, no further injury to the workers or the patients. We don't want to add to the burden of the emergency by hurting somebody who's involved with the care. Second, the old-fashioned ABCs, airway <laughs> bleeding uh, uh, circulation. Is, is everybody breathing? Is their blood flowing? Is the blood flowing through the body? If those are being taken care of. And the third one, infection control. 
uh, whether it's somebody who already has an infection such as tuberculosis, doing everything you can to keep them on their medications. Uh, somebody with HIV, keep them on their medications. But if it's uh, uh, somebody that uh, is uh, potentially a foodborne illness, uh, a uh, any of those things that could be spread person to person, do everything you can to control it so you don't spread it further within the group. And Dr. White, I'll pose this question to you. What type of medical care can be put off until later in an extreme event? Well, there are things, and um, I think what Dr. Gebby said, you know, those are the priorities, and so there are things that we do in, in healthcare that we don't like to think are things that aren't necessary because um, certainly they're routine activities every day that, that um, are a part of our jobs as healthcare professionals. But um, things like administration of oral medications. It may, it may be that we as the professionals won't be doing that and that that will be um, uh, the responsibility of the families or the patient to take their own medications and that in fact they'll be, it'll be given to them. Um, we do, um, as healthcare professionals, have an extensive system of documentation of care that, um, that we maintain and that's in everyone's best interest that we do, but you know, during an emergency situation, that's probably something that is gonna have to go, that in fact, the, the really crucial or critical things be documented so that we know how to follow up on them, but mm -hmm. that routine documentation um, won't be a part of what we do. Um, when you think about um, com maintaining complete privacy and confidentiality, uh, certainly those are you know, hallmarks of healthcare. And it's not that we would, um, you know, uh, deliberately uh, try to um, violate someone's privacy or confidentiality, but um, it probably won't be the same. Uh, we're not going to be having um, HIPAA forms signed and um, a lot of things like that while we're um, in the middle of an emergency situation. And really, any kind of elective procedures, you know, just would not be would not be done. All of that kind of thing yeah. would be left until later. An elective is a broader term than just saying we're not going to do plastic surgery during the event, uh, gallbladder surgery. Uh, which is done fairly routinely in this country, isn't an emergency in most circumstances. So that may just have to wait. Um, evaluation of a chronic condition that somebody's been getting along with for a long time. Well, you may have to get along with it for another week or two before we pull you in for the complete workup that in today's world in the United States you might get on a next day basis mm -hmm. in many cities. And who would these chain standards apply to? Everybody. Yeah. Any licensed health professional who's a part of this team will be a part of following through on these priorities and making them happen. It would be um, really at the um, immediate site of the disaster um, or at your usual place of work. It could be, though, unfortunately, um, maybe in your own facility, but you may be consolidated um, into another unit or relocated to another building um, on your uh, healthcare campus. Um, and it also applies um, to the healthcare professional who might be a volunteer and may actually be going into a community um, site that is not their um, normal place of work. So it, it really applies everywhere. You bring up an important point, the, the whole volunteer issue, and obviously they're critical to bolstering the capacity of an overstretched and, and exhausted workforce. However, there's problems, isn't, aren't there, when volunteers sort of self-deploy, arrive with all the intention right. of doing good, but it, it can cr create oh, problems, can't it? It creates immense problems, and the slogan that many of us are using in a variety of settings is no more SUVs. And we're not talking about those gas guzzlers. <laughs> okay. We're talking about spontaneous, unrequested volunteers. Just deciding to show up because you've heard there's a disaster at a hospital doesn't do anybody any good. It's uh, like doing uh, what we were told not to do as kids, chasing the fire truck or chasing the ambulance just to see what's going on because you might be able to do something. Uh, people are needed as volunteers, but through organized systems, through a local medical reserve corps, and nearly every community in the U.S. has one of those now, through the uh, national system of volunteers that's available. There's a registration system called ESAR-VIP. I think we've got the whole name of it on the screen for those who want to know what those stand for. And can be a way of having your credentials verified ahead of time. So if somebody asks for extra dentists, we know where to find legally licensed dentists or extra nurses of a certain kind. And then participate in training so that you know what's expected of a volunteer. I'm going to ask a question um, because it occurs to me that it's it's very important for people who think that they would want to volunteer in an emergency to become a part of this system. Mm -hmm. um, if you register for ESAR VIP or for Medical Reserve Corps, do you then are you obligated to be deployed 
uh, in an emergency, or can you refuse? You can say no. Um, all of those systems that I'm familiar with have a structure where when a call goes out, we need, we need X volunteers to come staff our medication distribution site. People have a chance to say yes or no if they're in the middle of something they can't leave, if they've got a family problem. But you shouldn't sign up if, in fact, you would have one day every 10 years available mm -hmm. to volunteer. You should sign up if you have a reasonable amount of time and are reasonably flexible in what you can do. So how does an agency, Dr. Gebby, prepare for an influx of volunteers? Or how does an agency prepare a cadre of volunteers to supplement their own workforce? Well, it, it's in preparation, which is the answer in both cases. Every institution in the country should know that in the case of a major emergency, they will be using volunteers, either a group of their own that they have already planned on and trained at the community level as a part of a local medical reserve corps, or that they've requested through an organized system and they're going to show up. And so they need a plan for how they're going to orient them to that facility, what kind of name bands they're going to give them so people know this is a volunteer, so that they've double-checked that there's somebody who shows up and says, I am a, a licensed nurse with an emergency room specialty, that you can verify that. And it isn't just helpful Hannah who showed up. <laughs> Dr. And Wade, is the Joint Commission weighed in on yes, this? Yes, I was going to say, and additionally, the Joint Commission, um, in addition to those standards um, that are specific just to emergency preparedness, actually has developed standards on volunteers. And uh, the first one uh, looks at assigning certain disaster responsibilities to volunteer practitioners. And then uh, the second one allows organizations to actually grant privileges to um, volunteers who are licensed um, healthcare practitioners to um, work in the facility. So it really formalizes then um, that ability to use those volunteers within the organization. And of course the concept of the Joint Commission is very familiar to our viewers who are healthcare professionals, but for those of us who are public health professionals and might not be familiar with the Joint Con uh, Commission, could you just give us a definition of what that is? Oh sure, the, uh, the Joint Commission uh, is an, a voluntary organization that um, hospitals and other healthcare organizations um, apply to for accreditation of their services. And um, it's a very extensive accreditation that um, they go through that includes site visits and planning ahead of time and, yeah, and really a continual readiness um, for um, the Joint Commission to come in and to evaluate how well an organization is doing and how well it meets some very specific standards in lots of things, including you know nursing services, physician services, other aspects allied health and support services. They look at the facilities of the organization and, um, and just you know, the overall um, services that a healthcare organization provides. So and everything goes, everything gets evaluated. Yeah. And while public health departments may not be used to that, the new Public Health Accreditation Board is looking at setting standards for health departments that I suspect will also include yeah. something about volunteers and something about emergencies. And so becoming familiar with this idea is not a bad one at all, no matter where you work. Good point. Dr. Gibby, where could we expect that healthcare professionals would have a presence during an extreme emergency? Well, could be almost anywhere. I mean, Dr. White listed off. You could be where you usually are, mm -hmm. other places. I think what's important to remember is that most of us who are health professionals aren't going to be where the thing went boom. We're not going to be right at the scene trying to sort people and pull them from, from rubble, although in the case of an earthquake, obviously that would be quite different. And most of us will not be in an emergency department where we're the first ones receiving patients, where we're having to decontaminate them from chemicals, hose them down, scrub them down, and so on. Most health professionals will be in a typical kind of patient care setting. Now, it may not be in the rooms they're used to, but it'll be with beds, with people who need care, giving medical, nursing, other forms of health care under these odd circumstances. Uh, but again, doing what looks a lot more like what they do every day within this different structure. Okay, and speaking of challenging circumstances, in the following clip we've asked staff at Albany Medical Center Hospital what they would do in the event of a three-day power outage. If we were to hear right now that we are experiencing power outage, whether it's regional, whether it's more localized to our campus, 
uh, we would certainly implement our Code D disaster response system. One of the first things we would do would be to identify what we think the uh, magnitude of the issue is and um, where we need what level of disaster we need to call. We have a room here within the hospital that is specifically set up to be the command center so that we can monitor internally and externally the events that are happening. We have to be certain that patient care and patient safety was our number one priority. And so all of our efforts would be focused in that direction. In a scenario where we had a regional outage, we would be talking with one another about our capacity, um, making sure that we are keeping things as distributed as we need to in order to maintain safe care. We would immediately assess what's going on in the emergency department, in the operating rooms, what's going on in our critical care areas, in our neonatal intensive care unit, in our delivery room, uh, in our cardiac cath lab. So there's just a host of critical care areas within the organization that we have to immediately assess. We know that our generator can power certain aspects of the hospital, uh, of the campus, for several days. But again, if we were to rely on that generator for that period of time in the event of a disaster, there would be some decisions that would need to be made. So obviously critical care equipment, patient ventilators, patient monitors, certain uh, pumps that are used for patients, all of that would have to be prioritized in terms of what remains plugged in, uh, what becomes unplugged. It's almost overwhelming to think that you would have to evacuate an entire hospital, let alone a given unit. Uh, through the emergency preparedness system and mechanisms, we have really begun to do things that will help us to respond more quickly. Certainly our first plan, as always, would be to move internally um, to get patients in a safe place and then um, more gradually move out of the facility and as a whole if we had to. The institution has begun to purchase evacu sleds, which are systems that fit under a patient's mattress and in the need uh, to evacuate, one person can actually take the patient mattress off the bed onto the floor safely and then begin to evacuate that patient down stairwells. Another answer to the question about what we would do in a three-day outage is um, to say it would depend somewhat on the season. Um, and the reason I say that is we have certain things that are affected by heat. We would have to recognize what our limitations might be in the number of operating rooms that we would be able to continue to run. Where obviously patients are the most vulnerable, they're under anesthesia, the physician is in the middle of a surgical procedure that may involve the chest, the abdomen, the head and brain, etc. We might have to, uh, you know, make some decisions as to patients leaving the organization if they were very close to being well enough to be discharged. Historically, whenever there's either a bad storm pending or something of this nature that happens, the hospital is often seen as a safe place, a safe haven, so we could very easily be overwhelmed. That's one of the things that worries me. And we have to remember that our, our staff are people as well, so they're vulnerable, they have families at home. We hope that folks won't arbitrarily refuse uh, to come into the institution. I think the most important thing uh, is preparation. We're very committed to doing a lot of training, a lot of education, and a lot of practice. I think that's probably the thing we can do that will help us the most. Every uh, institution really faces a dilemma in terms of uh, how ready are we for uh, a, a true a disaster event to occur. And we're always challenging ourselves because on a regional, state, federal basis, there are many of us who feel there's much, much, much more work to be done in order for us to call ourselves prepared. It's really a continuous challenge, never satisfied with the status quo, always looking to be certain that we can respond uh, better, uh, more safely, faster, more efficiently, more effectively in a disaster. Well, I think that video really encapsulates quite a bit of what we've discussed today. 
Very much so, and highlights the planning role that early advance, and particularly with regard to this issue of standards of care, the need for the health professionals to be there with the managers, the, the organizational leaders, to look at the issues, to make sure that the legal counsels who are involved have looked at this issue and understand the laws that are involved, and to make sure everybody documents at the system level what changes they're making so they can come back and critique them afterward. And I think with the, the changes that you're referring to, I think it's um, decision making mm -hmm. that happens um, during a, a disaster and mm -hmm. decisions that are made and then how those changes get implemented. And I, it's crucial that, um, that in fact those are documented and like the, the video said that then you can't be satisfied with the status quo that then you can go back and you can look at um, each step in the decision making and how the changes were implemented and how well did you do so that each time we do a better job. And we heard in the video that again there's the concern that employees might not be able to show up and and obviously during normal times we expect that the workforce will be there but I've heard some estimates that during a pandemic for instance Dr. White as, as many as 60 percent of healthcare professionals may not be available to go to work I mean, how, how do you we're talking about planning and preparedness but that seems like an overwhelming challenge Oh, it would be, and when you think about the fact that uh, that um, healthcare professionals themselves would be vulnerable um, to the to the the disease or to the emergency until we realize that it's there, uh, and so have implemented then procedures to um, keep infection at a uh, spread at a minimum, we would have to really plan for configurations of teams and and how our workers might be able to um, be deployed in in different. Um, I use the word again configurations but in different groups and so that um, if we close down units and we consolidate um, and so you may not be working in your specialty anymore but you um, as a nurse may be doing um, uh, work on another unit or maybe supporting other professionals or a physician um, may be directing a team that um, he or she's not used to directing um, likewise um, other staff may be deployed in different ways and these configurations have to be um, set up ahead of time we have to make plans for those and Again, we have to practice that and so that everyone who's involved would know what their responsibility would be in a different type of configuration and, um, and how mm -hmm. they would function. Dr. Mm -hmm. Kibbe, let me ask you about something that may be a newer term of art, rapid evacuation. And is that the same thing as uh, just-in-time training? A rapid, Ra uh, rapid education, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, it, I think the two words can be used interchangeably. No matter how much you've practiced ahead of time, no matter what you've gone to in terms of continuing ed, how many wonderful broadcasts you've paid attention to, the specifics of each emergency will require some up-to-date training. And so the institution has to have its training staff ready to go. If they've decided, for example, that what's usually a general patient unit is going to become an intensive care unit for all, for all intents and purposes, that's, they're going to fill it up with people who otherwise would go to an ICU. That staff is going to have to get a quick reminder of the extra things they may need to think about or worry about. Or if we've suddenly diagnosed an, a new disease that we haven't um, thought about, quickly get the information out to everybody on what they're doing. Uh, you're suddenly releasing equipment that people haven't seen before. Make sure it comes with instructions so people know which button to push if they're going to start using it. And what you're really referring to, I guess, could be considered in-house rapid education. But you both discussed earlier the cascade effect and continuum need that the public may get involved in providing care to some extent. So how does in-house rapid education differ from rapid education for the public? In basic structure, I'm not sure that it differs very much. It's You stick to the key facts. You base it on what you want people to do, not necessarily what you want them to pass a lengthy test on. Uh, you uh, focus on essential information and you give it in language that people can understand. So what I explained to the nurses in this new ICU about the disease we're worried about may use slightly different language than what I asked the press office to put out on our public information line or on our website may be different from what the county health officer is explaining on the TV camera to the general public, but they all ought to be consistent with one another and be factually accurate. And quick, quickly um, relayed quickly assembled. and clear. And Dr. White, what should a group or agency determine, uh, or how rather should a group or agency determine which standards of care to adopt during drills 
Um, who determines which standards are more sound or accommodating? Well, I, it's involving the professionals that are um, that are in the organization in that decision making, and really the only way because. The, this isn't routine. We don't have lots of disasters, luckily. Uh, that the only way you can really do this is to involve the professionals through um, disaster drills, through disaster exercises that you know are done. Um, and I would say uh, most of our organizations have something like that at, at least annually, where the staff are involved. And so by having them go through an exercise or a drill that includes um, some scenarios where you may have to adapt standards during that particular scenario. It gives the opportunities for the professionals who are involved to talk about it and to say, well, we could do this in this situation or we could do that in, in another situation. Always thinking about those, those three priorities, though, that have to main, be maintained, um, the safety, the um, airway breathing and circulation, um, and uh, the... Um, um, infection and control. infection control, <laughs> right? Exactly. Sorry, um, <laughs> but th th so those would not be, but it would be other other kinds of things mm -hmm. that they might be right. making decisions. And in on. fact, the staff may have good ideas. Let's take the infection control, thinking about if we haven't got a sink on every corner, what what alternate substances we can we use? How can we use our gloves widely wisely? How do we move from patient to patient to minimize spread while using what we have available? which also actually feeds into the issues of chain of command because yeah, if the professionals are consulted and come up with a good plan it has to be put into the hospital plan and it has to be fed up and down the chain so that everybody knows what's expected knows who to turn to if they have a question uh, this involves also the the volunteers if a volunteer shows up how do you know they're really a volunteer and who do you ask to verify their credentials and so on let me ask you dr. Gebby about a governor issued or governor declared emergency a lot of people have have the idea that that's just in place to get FEMA funds, but there's more to it, isn't there? Well, there is. Uh, we do hear about that. Governor X has just declared an emergency in five counties, and FEMA will show up tomorrow to help you with your loans or something like that. But depending on the state you're in and state law, uh, governors do have the ability to suspend some laws during emergencies that might change some requirements in uh, reporting or might change some licensure for hospitals or any number of things like that. So it is important for the individual health professional to be familiar with this legal structure for the state in which he or she practices. And as your slide indicates, also uh, specific changes in protocols. It's Exactly. Uh, some states have a very specific protocol-driven plan that's a part of that. Uh, North Dakota is one I happen to be familiar with, with a single state medical director during a pandemic who would be able to issue protocols for the whole state to follow. Not every state could do that, but you need to know. Dr. White, in thinking in terms of an extreme emergency and the demands that could be placed on healthcare professionals, obviously the physical challenges come to mind, working long hours, uh, having to do heavy lifts with equipment they're not used to. Uh, I recently uh, talked to a healthcare professional who was older uh, but wanted to continue working but really worried that should there be an emergency, having to care for patients on the ground might be something her back wasn't up to. So we think a lot of, and, and, and truly something, you know, to consider. We think a lot about the physical challenges, but what about psychosocial needs and, and what kind of psychological assessment should be done after an emergency? Well, that, that's an extremely important thing that has to be planned for from the very beginning. So it needs to be a part of those plans that organizations and communities think about. Um, and we did hear in the group that, um, that we have put together to develop the white paper that psychosocial assessment and the mental health needs not only of the the victims of the emergency but also the health professionals that are um, that you're referring to are extremely important and it isn't something that's often on the priority list or at the, mm -hmm. that we're thinking about early on and so that it, uh, I think that psychosocial assessment needs to be a part of the um, evaluation post event in our organizations and across the community, how well did um, all of the resources work together? Uh, who responded? Um, what kind of assistance um, was needed? Um, what resources did we have to access? Were they there? Or did we have enough accesses, uh, resources? Excuse me. And then we really need to um, then uh, evaluate how well we returned to our pre-event status and how quickly we were able to move back um, in the way we needed to. And could people? The themselves psychologically get back 
to um, the status quo or to, to functioning the way that they had prior to the disaster. That's one of the hardest things because we get so caught up as professionals in this change that then all of a sudden the electricity is back on, the water supply is there, and we're going back to routine activities. And we're not, I mean, we're still, we're still <laughs> moving and we're not ready to, to go back to, to the routine. And so part of that um, assessment has to really um, include a debrief and, and, and a care for our practitioners. Let's stay mm -hmm. on that topic of uh, evaluation after an event mm -hmm. or a, a drill. Um, obviously, a lot goes right and some things go wrong. And, and how can you ensure that what didn't work out quite as well as you had wanted becomes a part of your future planning? I can only guarantee it if I do it for myself. If I've been through an emergency and realized I didn't have a good phone tree to tell my family what was going on, I'm the only one who can quickly send a new phone tree to the family and do it. And if I put that on my, oh yeah, I have to do that next week, it won't happen. And organizations are the same. If they don't turn to someone and say, and while we're following up on this emergency, here's what we found went wrong, and Dr. White, by next Tuesday, I'd like to see what you've done about it, or some equivalent of that, it too will get pushed aside in the rush of getting back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. Again, we're getting to the institutional and individual preparedness, and they really have to go hand in hand. What does an individual need to do to be sure they're prepared to respond if they're a healthcare professional? Obviously, a good phone tree. You mentioned a good, that. A good yeah. phone tree. Yes. Well, uh, and I think that you have said that, that we have to have that individual personal professional readiness plan. You have to have that developed. Um, and uh, we all really should, as soon as this um, uh, taping is over, need to think about what it is if you don't have one in place for you now. Um, additionally, and uh, hopefully our audience um, is, is already meeting this by participating in continuing ed about emergency preparedness. It's something that we as health professionals really have an obligation to do. And it's to learn about um, not only what, what we would normally do in uh, you know, maybe natural disasters, but what might you normally do in pandemic? And I, and I think that we don't plan or learn um, enough about a broad range of emergency situations. And then finally, uh, you have to participate in those emergency drills and exercises that um, our organizations and our communities um, implement. And it, it's really our responsibilities as a healthcare professional to figure out how will we participate in those and to make the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some professionals who've said something like, oh good, I missed another drill because I was <laughs> off today. Yes. Uh, rather than saying, oh dear, I missed that drill, mm -hmm. I better make sure I'm here for the next one because that practice is what will make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's that individual and agency partnership yeah. that I think that, you know, that we continually refer to. And then you add the community in partnership. And so it's really three levels. Mm -hmm. We think about it institutional and organizational, but you really have those, the, three, the three partners. Right. You know, this next topic I want, did you want to add no, to go, that? No, go right ahead. The next topic I wanted to put out there, and I'd appreciate both of you weighing in on it, um, let me use a drastic example because I think the topic is of, of great concern. Post Katrina, and some healthcare professionals actually faced criminal penalties because of the way they responded when, in fact, they, they argue they were doing the best they could in impossible circumstances. Now, we talked about uh, maybe less severe uh, issues, patient confidentiality, failure to document the way you would normally do, but still, there has to be the concern in there for what legal ramifications could I face and, and how do you get around that and help healthcare professionals be okay about changing the way they do business? Hopefully, a discussion like this, the white paper that's going to show up on the resource list, the emergency practices will raise people's level of comfort. But you do need to know the law. You need to know what your licensure law says about your rights and responsibilities. You need to know what your state's emergency law says about obligations and responsibilities. And you need to then use your best professional brain to do the best. There's nothing that can stop people from suing you for Lord knows what. Um, a prosecutor can decide to make a point, make a case, do something. Uh, we cannot stop that. But we each have to turn back to our best 
professional comfort that I did the best I could, I knew what I was supposed to do, I worked within the system that I'd practiced within, and that's all I can stand on. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important, kind of as a follow-up, um, that um, as a worker, um, participate or uh, as an employee of an organization, that you're very clear with your employer um, exactly what limitations mm -hmm. you might have um, in responding to an emergency situation um, when they put out the call for all employees, for instance, to come in. If you are um, caring for an elderly relative, for instance, um, it might take you longer to get in than the next person who um, has no children and you know no elderly relative living with them but rather than to be seen as a person who didn't arrive for three hours you know, with you know the unknown reason uh, where you know again then you get into to that idea of um, well you know was that person just not responding were they you know could they could charges be mm -hmm. um, leveled against them because they were abandoning what they could do of uh, what they should do um, your employer knows about that likewise if you would have to leave leave when a disaster or an emergency arose in order to get something in place and then be able to return. You don't want to look like you're abandoning care. But if your employer knows that ahead of time, that could be part of the planning. And they say, well, you can leave as soon as this. Um, you may not be able to go right away, but at least the plans are in place for that. I had a personal experience. I'm not a healthcare professional, but involved in public health, and there was an alert at a nuclear power plant. And I was asked to, to go there and, and to provide some public information. And I had to care for my grandmother the next evening. At 6 o'clock, I had to be there to give her her medicine. And I had to say, I will go, but I have to be back. Because mm -hmm. the home health aide can't get there. Yeah. Her primary caregiver himself is ill. And it was okay. They said, fine, we're glad to know that. Um, yeah. We can use you when we can, and we'll get you back. Yeah. It's important that workers know they should not hesitate to disclose that information to their employer. I think that's really the bottom line. Yeah, because we are at a point where in order to put the whole system together, we have to share as a team. Mm -hmm. And if you've been carrying on at work as if you didn't have burdens while you were really dashing home every night to yeah. give grandma her insulin or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, this isn't the time to keep looking like you're not vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's the time to say, this is what I'm living with. Can I work this shift? Can I come in on these days during the emergency so I can do my other thing? Because your employer can't plan unless he or she has accurate information. Exactly, exactly. Dr. Gabby, who should a worker rely on for guidance concerning care and resources during an extreme event? Well, the first thing you fall back on are your professional competencies. You are no less competent than you were the day before the power went out. And you use what you know to take advantage of what's there. But you also pay attention through the chain of command to what you're being told about the available resources, about who to call for what or where to ask if you need extra help to see what's going to be available to round out what you might not usually have. And uh, obviously we've said that you need to communicate any difficulties. How does that rapid education, rapid training come into play? For example, if you are working in an unusual place and somebody wheels up a piece of equipment and says, here's the ventilators we're using now, and you've never seen this model before, and you have no clue, the person who wheeled it up should have brought with you either a handy-dandy push-button A to get started instruction sheet or said, and the trainer will be by in five minutes to tell all of you how to work this. That is, it has to be available right there. If you truly don't know how to work the machine, don't just start poking things into patients and pushing buttons because that would be a professional mistake in what you're doing. And I imagine the person who's delivering the machine is very harried and trying to rush off, but you need to be confident enough to say, look, we're going to need some in-service on this right. before we can use right. it. Right, or turn to whoever is your supervisor mm -hmm. to say, we've got the machines, we will not use them until somebody provides us with at least one copy of the instruction sheet. That seems reasonable. <laughs> Dr. White, so... Let's assume that we're getting through this extreme event um, <laughs> as well as can be expected. Now what does an individual need to do? Well, I, we're all responsible for participating in that post-event evaluation. Mm -hmm. We absolutely, I think that's one of the, the most critical things. And so uh, when it's over with, you want to still make time um, to think back on what went well. Um, 
you might have to uh, have a psychosocial needs assessment for either yourself, your family, other workers that you're um, with in an organization. And you may have to actually, in fact, seek assistance if, mm -hmm. if you're not um, returning psychologically to, um, uh, you know, to the pre-event um, functioning. And so that's, that's key. Um, Included in that would also be um, looking at updating your personal plan. Um, we've talked about um, so many things here about what you have to put in place and who you have to alert and you know, knowing that your children would be comfortable and where they would be and who would get the next meal while you were responding to the disaster. But how well did your personal plan work? And um, were you called a couple times while you were um, participating in the emergency that you know, they couldn't account for a child or um, someone uh, didn't have access to food um, at home. And finally, I think the uh, last thing that we also need to point out is that we have to participate in activities that get us back to our pre-event status. And that's something that's that's glossed over, and we've talked about mm -hmm. it a little bit here. But um, in fact, as as healthcare professionals, we need to make sure that that we then begin functioning like pre-event again. And so there are things. Um, like you may be actually told you may go home now um, and get some rest. Please don't come back for another 48 hours. You've been here for 72. We're going to call in some other people who have not been here. Um, some of us are reluctant at that point you know, to, to pass the reins on because you just feel like you're, you're on autopilot in a way responding to the emergency. And it's time now for, for you to, to um, go back to pre-event status. Mm -hmm. yeah. Working on adrenaline and maybe yeah. feeling that if mm -hmm. you, if you, if you go away, you won't be able to come back, yeah. you won't have the yeah. wherewithal right. to do it. Mm -hmm. it. There are interesting phenomena about this operation on adrenaline during the mm -hmm. acute phase of an emergency that gets people all excited mm -hmm. and they really do come through, they do a lot. They can also then be disappointed if it turns out what's really needed is somebody over on the other side of town to run a primary care clinic mm -hmm. to keep people out of the hospital and you're used to working in a hospital and you know that's where the scene of things is, to be told to go over there and check out coughs, colds, and sore throats can feel like a real letdown. Mm -hmm. And so understanding how the system fits together, why those what seems like more mundane tasks need to be done, how you still are using your professional confidence, you're, you're operating within the same basic guidelines uh, to do those other tasks is important. And those may be what's more important for getting the whole system back mm -hmm. on an even keel. Because if you neglect those day-to-day -day healthcare needs too long, then you've just built up a backlog that'll be a real problem later on. Mm -hmm. I want to interrupt the dis discussion just for a quick note to our viewers. We're ready to take your calls now, and the toll-free number is 800-452-0662. And you may also send your written questions at any time by fax. The number is 518-426-0696, or by email to the address on your screen. You know, we both talked about standards of care. We've mentioned this uh, several times in the course of this discussion. Uh, you had a number of collaborators in preparing these standards, did you not? Want to talk about that? Uh, I think we've got a couple of slides that can show the list, and I hope it's long enough so everybody can spot their name or tell their mother to look quickly. Well, I see both their of name our guests there. right on top. We, uh, we uh, <laughs> did have the privilege of co-chairing this group, and as you can see, it represented a wide range of specialties, both within nursing and across the fields of health care, including a representative most concerned about people with disabilities, uh, psychiatric care. We had uh, sort of everything we could think of. Uh, that would help us think this through, be honest about the fears, and find ways of describing what might be helpful to people. This discussion apparently is resonating. We've already received three questions, so let me take them in order, and either or both of you can answer. The first is, um, can either of you share a little bit more about the white paper, and uh, how can viewers access it? Sure, the, um, the white paper um, is available at um, the American Nurses Association um, website. And in fact, I think we might have a slide um, that we could put up. Um, there it is. There it is, okay, that um, shows where you can get this. Um, it's the www.nursingworld.org, um, which is the ANA um, website. But then um, in order to get straight to the uh, white paper, you can see that you want to use their um, main menu categories, health care and policy issues, the DPR the law ethics of disaster response and adapting standards of care. But I think you can 
I think there's also a link on the front page of the Nursing World website yeah. that will take yeah. you right or to that. Or a good search device there if you put in uh, extreme, extreme conditions, I yeah. believe. And if the, any of our viewers were scribbling furiously, I just want to remind them that we will have these slides online following the broadcast, <laughs> so you can, you can check yeah. into the website there and yeah. get that. And I think, um, and I think you may have um, you saw on that slide that there are also some other really wonderful resources that um, are available in addition to the white paper that we were involved with, um, you can go to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality website. They have um, a, a thing on community planning, a guide for um, mass medical care with scarce resources. The AMA has National Disaster Life Support um, uh, uh, information on theirs. Uh, on the one with the ANA, there is also the, the Columbia University School of Nursing that Dr. Gebby is a professor at, um, has uh, their Center for Health Policy, has their own um, information, which is wonderful, clinician competencies during initial assessment and management of emergency events. You know, and I'm going to ask our viewers to make sure to check in with our um, our website to get those resources. We've got a couple more questions. Oh, yeah. oh okay. And, and okay, okay, great. I do great. want to get them in before the end oh, sure. of the broadcast. Okay. Um, one of our uh, viewers wants to know, how do we do an ongoing evaluation and meet psychosocial needs during an extended emergency like a pandemic? And if you could answer that in about a minute, minute and a half, that would be great. <laughs> I think one of the responsibilities of the safety officer under incident command is emotional as well as physical safety. And any institution ought to set up a system to make sure workers are getting breaks and that during those breaks, somebody checks in with them to see how they're doing. If you don't build it into your safety program, it could get lost. Dr. White, your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I would agree, and I think that, you know, it's just that planning so that you know what resources, you know, you have and how you continue to deploy them. And I think what you, we might have think about in extended times would be the consolidation of resources. It may not be your own agency that has all of them. We may be mm -hmm. sending resources across town or moving mm -hmm. things around. And mm -hmm. so that, that kind of work hap happens in extended situations. Yeah. Okay, and one final question. Should hospitals have written nursing standards of care for extreme situations that address what tasks registered nurses can delegate to LPNs, nurse techs, or other non-licensed professionals? Well, I don't know that they would have written standards of care, um, and so I, I, this is always kind of the rub. I will tell you among health professionals, um, we've suggested here that um, during drills and exercises that this kind of conversation happens and that scenarios are discussed so that in fact when um, an emergency situation would arise that you can um, do that. But each one, it depends on the situation. And I do want to clarify your title, Dr. White, Director for Masters of Nursing at the John Hopkins School of the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. Yes, thank so, you. There we <laughs> yes. go. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We would like to ask you to please fill in your, fill out your online evaluation. Your feedback, as we said, is always helpful in planning future programs. And continuing education credits are available after completing the post test. We'll put you to work. This program will be available online within a week or so. Please check our website for details. I'm Chris Smith. We hope to see you in the fall for the continuation of the University at Albany Center for Public Health Preparedness Grand Round Series. Thank you so much. What a great well, discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh,